Hello there, and welcome to the Dear Dyslexic podcast series brought to you by Rethink Dyslexia, the podcast where we're breaking barriers and doing things differently. I'm Shay Wissell, your host, and I'm so glad you can join us. I'm a fellow neurodivergent, and I'm coming from the lands of the Rwandri people of the Kulin Nation, where I live and work. And I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to all the tribes across our beautiful country and to all First Nations people listening today. Our podcast was born in 2017 out of a need to give a voice to the stories and perspectives of adults with dyslexia. And our voice has grown stronger year after year. We're now a globally listened to podcast with guests from all around the world. Join us for insightful conversations about living with dyslexia and other neurodivergences across all walks of life. Our special focus is on adult education, employment, social and emotional well-being, and entrepreneurship. We're excited to be bringing you this episode and invite you to like and follow us, or even better, why not leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform? So let's get started. Hello there, and welcome to this two-part podcast series. My guest today, Gareth Robinson, and I had so much to talk about that we had to create two episodes, so I really hope you can stick around for both of them. Gareth is a family man, first and foremost, a coach, sales leader, startup founder, and mental health advocate. He brings 20 years of blue chip corporate experience and over five years of coaching and consulting to the party. So as you can tell, we had a lot to talk about. Gareth's professional and personal purpose overlap as he does his bit to help people live better and organisations grow. He loves contributing to his community, shining a light on the importance of developing good mental health and redefining success. I asked Gareth to come onto the show today as I was looking to talk to some other business owners, founders, dyslexics who had experienced grief and loss. And I was seeking these conversations after losing my mum late last year. And I came across Gareth's videos. He's been creating a series called The Grief Train, following the loss of his brother. Gareth shares tips about how we can manage during times of stress, grief and loss by implementing tiny habits that can really change our lives and help us manage during some of our toughest days. Before we get started, though, I must note that this episode contains uh, sensitive discussions about not just grief and loss, but also suicide. It's including uh, Gareth's experiences and my personal experiences and some of the mental health challenges. While today's conversation aims to promote understanding and to reduce stigma, we acknowledge that hearing about grief and particularly suicide can be triggering for some of you listening today. So please, if you find any of this content distressing, your well-being matters and it is essential to prioritise your mental health above all else and consider seeking support. You can access Lifeline on 131114 or contact a Beyond Blue counsellor on 1300224636. I really hope you get as much out of this two-part series as I have done in implementing little habits to help me manage through some of my toughest and darkest days. I'm super excited to have on the show today, Gareth. Welcome to the show, Gareth. Thanks, Shay. I was doing some research recently following the passing of my mum to try and find people that I could talk to as a business owner around how we manage um, business and life when we're going through a traumatic time and uh, whether it's grief and loss or um, something stressful has happened at work and or you're not well or someone you're with is not well and I was struggling to find people that I could talk to about uh, this topic and I came across Gareth's work uh, on Instagram through the grief train and so I followed uh, Gareth and contacted him and he kindly said he would be happy to come and talk to me today about his story and um, how we manage life when we're going through traumatic events so thank you so much Gareth for coming on the show today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Would you be able to give uh, our listeners a little bit of a background about yourself and your work and um, how the grief train started? Sure. So firstly, I think I'm a pretty lucky guy. I was born into a uh, a middle-class family in New Zealand. Um, 
I now live in Sydney, Bondi's home. I'm very lucky to have a beautiful wife, two kids, 16-year-old daughter and a, and a 12-year-old son. I have a roof over my head. I, I have a couple of jobs, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So, you know, overall, I'm a really lucky guy. Uh, my story, I don't believe, is particularly unique in that um, about six years ago, I was made redundant. I'd spent 20 plus years in corporate. And over the last five or six years, I've been on a few different journeys. Um, one was to start a consultancy, um, failed at that. Uh, second kind of work-based adventure was uh, bootstrapped a startup with my brother-in-law around uh, creating a community to support people, um, launched an app with that, and again, to date, failed uh, with that adventure. So from a work point of view, you could look at my last five, six years as, as an amazing adventure, perhaps not the most commercially successful. That's when I started Mind Habit as a consultancy coaching business. Alongside that journey in the last three years, I've also lost three people close to me to suicide. Uh, one was the best man at my wedding. One was a close childhood friend. And then uh, the third person I lost to suicide, uh, August 22nd last year, uh, was my brother, my big brother, Ben. So um, that probably brings us to why, you know, we've connected. Uh, and again, thanks for having me. And that's probably, yeah, that's, that's probably why I'm here, is that I've dealt with loss um, over the last few years, and in particular with my brother, who I was very close to. And um, and yeah, so uh, that, that probably sums that up. Yeah, and I really connected when I was watching the grief train and um, such raw conversations so early on in losing someone we love um, is really challenging to be so vulnerable in sharing our experiences, uh, particularly the way you've been sharing yours through uh, the grief train. But with your work with Mindful Habits, we were talking about how do we how do we keep going when we're when we're in such a situation? And it could be we've lost someone, or you know, there's a variety of reasons where we could end up feeling uh, grief and loss. And through the work you've done, what is some of the ways that we can look after ourselves but still keep going um, during these difficult times? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and and as with most things in life, it's very complex. And before I jump into uh, my answer or answers, I, I do want to mention, so I'm not a qualified psychologist. However, um, in the last four or five years, in part through the bootstrap startup, but also in my own journeys with mental health and in um, working with and, and, you know, communicating and loving my brother over the last three years as he struggled with the black dog, um, I've invested a fair amount of time and money in understanding what makes people tick and how habits in particular can help us get through um, these difficult times. So I just wanted to kind of set the scene on that. The thing with habits is, as BJ Fogg will tell us, and he is the founder of Stanford University's Behaviour Change Lab and the author of a book called Tiny Habits, as BJ will tell us, um, most of us have been using the wrong rule book or instruction manual when it comes to embedding healthy new habits. It's a little bit like buying a bedside table from Ikea, as many of us have done, bringing it home, opening the box, and suddenly finding you know, the instruction manual for a dining table. It's not going to go very well for you. And that's you know, an example of how many of us, including myself up until a few years ago, uh, how we viewed habits and, you know, shifting positively our our routines in the wrong way. Um, before I jump into the kind of habit stuff, though, I would like to unload a little bit on on just how we view time as well, because I feel like with most things, a lot of this is around mindset and how we uh, listen or not listen to the voices in our head, which we all have. And obviously, this ties back. My my view on this is slightly um, biased or, or very much influenced by my experience with my brother um, and and his battles with um, anxiety, with depression over 
over 18 years and in particular in the last three years. So if that's okay, Shay, can I talk a little bit about just different views of time? Yes, of course. And I think for our listeners, because they might be thinking this is a bit of an unusual topic <laughs> for me to be uh, talking about on our show, but I I just want to bring them back also to the fact around um, that not just in business and managing challenges, but also day to day, people that are neurodiverse um, generally face higher rates of anxiety and depression and are likely um, higher rates of suicide or likely to attempt suicide. And so the reason I wanted to speak to Gareth today was we've got so many different topics we wanted to talk about, but part of it was around managing when we're in challenging times and the importance of having some habits and some structure to help support that. And um, I think I should have given that context to our listeners today because they'll be like, this isn't a dyslexic conversation, but we will be bringing it back around to um, to dyslexia. So hold on to your hats while we unpack. So please, Gareth, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's a good, you can put it in the show notes, uh, Shay. So, and by the way, uh, this is something that Shay did not know when we first connected, but uh, my, my brother was was dyslexic and um, he was later in life diagnosed with inattentive ADHD, okay? So, um, yeah, as, as, a, as a side note. Um, wow, okay, where to, where to go with this? Right. Um, just again, want to unpack that because why I'm here in part is the loss of my brother. So obviously what I'm about to share did not help my brother. So, well, let me rephrase that. It helped, but it helped not enough in my eyes. So, you know, again, just want to want to call that out. Um, but let's talk about our view of time and how that affects our mental health and helps us cope in moments of stress, whether that's the loss of a loved one or, or simply just difficult times at home or at work. So I want to talk about past, present, and future. At a high level, how we view the past, present, and future can affect our mental health, our our happiness, or how contented we are, and how we deal with uh, stress in our lives. So firstly, when we think about past, often people let their past define who they are today. And that can be a risk for all of us, um, therefore, from what I've learned and what a lot of experts talk about is that you need to be a little bit conscious or conscious, I should say, of your past and ensure that certainly the negative events that you can no longer change don't define who you are today, recognising that every day we have the opportunity to be a different person to get a little bit better. So that's the past. The present is more around how we compare ourselves to others. And, you know, I I can put my hand up. This is something that I've I've been challenged with as most uh, is that I compare myself to others, my my commercial success, my my health, my a whole lot of things. Human beings, we compare ourselves to others. And the technique here that I want to talk a little bit about is comparing the right things. So rather than comparing that external material stuff, if you like, the house, the car, the holidays, the family, um, even as a parent, the ability to parent. Um, We should really focus in on what I would call our core values and behaviours, and that's the stuff we should compare if we're going to compare anything. So I'm going to pause now just in case, Shay, you have anything to add. Otherwise, I can move from the past, the present, onto the future. I think... um... It's an important point around the past because as uh, someone with dyslexia, it's very easy for us to carry with us the trauma that we've experienced, particularly in school. And um, it's really hard for us to leave that trauma behind when we're moving into environments where we're in situations where we've got to read or write and may not be able to disclose. So it will be interesting to talk to you further about how um we can move beyond some of that um by using the techniques you're going to talk about today well one of those techniques or tools is looking at those events in our past and you know similar to the cognitive behavioral theorists talk about reframing them um in particular the the one of the issues of the past is you cannot control it because it's already happened 
So if I if I talk a little bit about circles of control, which move us also into the future, um, a really nice technique and tool is to think about those circles of control, influence, and concern. And often the stresses that are amplified when we're dealing with loss or grief, um, or perhaps uh, we're neurodiverse and, and again, we, we have some um, things maybe harder that um, someone who isn't would, would not uh, expect to be difficult, perhaps, that, that everything just becomes harder. Therefore, understanding what we can control within that inner circle of control, which is often tied to our thoughts and feelings, and then what we can influence, which is the ring outside the inner, which is, again, we can only influence some of those things, the, the, how our friends behave, um, our jobs, we can't always control them. Sometimes we can only influence in the situation we're in. And then outside of that is what people call the circle of concern. And when you think about it, the past and the future sit squarely in the circle of concern. We can't change what's happened in the past. We can only change our perception and all the narrative we tell ourselves around that. We can't actually change the future because it doesn't exist yet. So I feel that view of time and, you know, certainly in my world around helping manage my stress levels and anxiety um, is trying to remind myself through visual and verbal cues to focus in the present, which many people talk about, um, to recognize from the past that it doesn't have to define who I am today. And part of that can also be letting go of um even letting go of friendships, perhaps, if they're not productive for you or certain environments that are not helping you change positively. And then future state, and for me personally, this is the hardest bit, is try not to stress about an event that hasn't happened yet. And I'll talk a little bit about kind of reverse engineering that shortly, but for now, perhaps I'll pause because I've been talking for a little while and see if Shay's got anything to add. Well, there's lots of things going around in my head because... And the reason I contacted you was around grief and uh, listening to you talk then, I, I had my dyslexic hat on of what happens to us as dyslexics. But then as you were just talking, I was always also thinking, you know, how do we, when we've been in a traumatic event like losing someone or losing our job or marriage breakdown, um, how do we kind of move out of that past because it's easy to get, and I know as being someone who's been divorced as well, it's easy to get caught up on, um, not caught up, but you're reflecting constantly on if you've lost someone or you've your relationship's broken down, you're in that state of the past a lot in your reflecting mm -hmm. time or your grief. Um, and so sometimes it's hard to be in the present when you're, you've constantly got those thoughts going around your head mm. and and again a qualifying that i'm not a psychologist but i feel there are some actions or activities that we can take to perhaps if we are ruminating about anything it doesn't have to be the past there are small actions we can take that can try and perhaps break that uh rumination if you like in addition something my brother-in-law in fact shared with me um is he, he tries, and not always successfully, to only take the baggage from his past with him that is adding value to him today. So that's a question we need to ask ourselves. Is, is that baggage or that event in the past and my reaction to it and response, is that helping me deal with my present day and future state? And I can only speak for myself, but I've found when I ask myself that question, and analyze a little bit some of the the baggage some of the issues um that i still have and are still concerns for me um it, it helps me because i realize that it's not actually helping me today here and now to to be concerned about that something that is outside my circle of control and influence and doesn't help me do anything better today or, or be be you know more content or happier so hopefully that makes sense yeah, it does, and it's a it's a good way to frame it. And also, as you're talking about the circle of influence, we will have that diagram up for 
people that love visuals like myself, if you haven't heard of this concept before, um, it's one I love to use as well. And we'll put a diagram up that kind of shows you how the how the flow works from the inner to the outer as well. But I think um, reflecting on what you just said about how does that how does that help me in the now um, is a is a positive way to reflect on what's going on. Mm. Yes, and and another just to expand on that, and we haven't even gotten to habits yet. Goodness, but <laughs> another uh, another technique that I learned from the Stoics um, that some of your listeners may have heard. You know, Stoicism has kind of regained popularity as a philosophy through many people. Uh, it's only one philosophy, but there's some quite good techniques. And in fact, I mentioned cognitive behavioral theory earlier, and and quite a few people um, feel that kind of. CBT is based on a lot of stoic principles from, you know, from thousands of years ago. Um, quite a few stoics talk about turning obstacles into opportunities. And so, you know, that is something, again, for me, uh, language and just a, a, almost a mantra or a saying or some, and I, and I will write these on post-it notes. You know, if you look at my home office, I have probably seven or eight post-it notes with almost mantras or just reminders for me to remind myself when I'm stressed what is actually important to me um, and and just to kind of, again, shift gears or, or get out of that, um, that, that in a dialogue with myself. Now, sometimes, like the loss of your, your beautiful big brother, um, that's a pretty big obstacle. So if, we, if, we, if I unpack that a little bit, like how, how can I turn that into an opportunity? And there are actually many ways that I can turn that into an opportunity. It, it does, doesn't necessarily, it's, it's not that, it's, it's not an experience you'd wish anyone to go through, um, but there are positives from the loss of my brother and they're small, but they're there. And, and one is the gift that he has given me in the, and others um, and this is quite common to embrace life more fully. It's very common when we lose things, um, whether it's a brother, or a, a, a husband, or a job. You know, you reset, and you and so he he has given me that gift. He's, I believe, um, you know, his entity is is still around in some form or another. So my relationship has changed with my brother, but you know, I try and um, again, I try and be more in the present. I try to um, enjoy life more fully um, because uh, life can be short. So certainly back to that turning an obstacle into an opportunity, that's one opportunity. Um, another opportunity, and this is where giving, which is actually one of kind of a key pillar within habits, I believe, is giving, volunteering, um, what, however you give, and most of us do in some form or another, it's extremely valuable. And so when you are dealing in the, can I, can I swear on this podcast? Yes, of course, mate. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's heard me swear right. many times, well, I'm sure, unless my mum's made me cut them out, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yes, please go yeah. ahead. <laughs> You're listening, mum. Close your ears. When you're <laughs> right in the shit, right, and it's just, you know, you're struggling to find, you know, where is where is the, because people talk about this, oh, you know, there's a silver lining. Well, what is it when your big brother uh, has suicided, you know, and left a eight and 10 year old kids and, you know, you worry about your parents, all that stuff. Well, as I said, there, there is always an opportunity. And one opportunity is to look at your behaviors and go, how can I help? How can I help my brother's wife? How can I help my brother's kids? How can I help my parents? So you give of yourself. This, it, to me, is very powerful. It's it's almost when you can't see any other light or opportunity in that obstacle. Try and think outside of yourself and go, how can my actions and behaviours help others? And that, at least for me, I find that very powerful because I believe through my um, actions, my behaviours. That's you know one of the reasons that I I am posting my my download on on you know the grief train is simply that I feel that will help some people. And um, and and as we know, those that do give, you get far more back than what you give. So um, I'll perhaps pause then as well um, to see if there's anything else we need to chat before we move on. At Rethink Dyslexia, we are doing things differently. 
as a global leader in creating inclusive environments for adults with dyslexia, our commitment is to provide individuals with opportunities to live healthier, happier, and more connected lives. Through our range of tailored services, including coaching, learning and development programs, consultancy, and training, we're helping dyslexic individuals, businesses, and organizations to better understand and support their dyslexic employees. So if you're looking for insights, inspiration, and expert advice on dyslexia and how you can provide inclusive practices and environments, then head to rethinkdyslexia.com to find out more or book your free consultation today. I feel like we're going to have to have a uh, sequence podcast to this conversation because um, there's two points that I would like to discuss further. One is um, seeing an opportunity out of such grief. And uh, I think I've I've been able to see see that in my mum passing away. And I think one of it was just bringing me back to my values of I need to be try and be as healthy as possible so that I can live longer than my mum got to. And with a yes. young daughter, that's very prominent in my head. And so that's what's getting me out of bed to go for my runs in the morning at the moment. I don't know how long that will last. But um, we have to try. But also you said about giving. And how do you give and not feel overwhelmed, like from your perspective? Because, again, we're not psychologists. We're here having a chat about our experiences around grief and business and life. Um, But how have you, have you felt overwhelmed in that giving? Because sometimes I've felt that being able to support all those other people that you kind of mentioned in the family dynamic uh, at times can be overwhelming as the, as the eldest child in my family. Um, So how do you look after yourself when you're giving so much? Or is it because you see it as such a positive that you don't feel that it's overwhelming you at times? Okay, well, that's that's a great observation and question, Shay. Um, well, the very first person you need to give to is yourself, regardless, you know, loving kindness, which some of you would have heard of, you know, we, we need to give to ourselves first before we can give to others. Um, if you are lucky like me, then the act of giving um, does give to yourself. And saying that, um, yeah, I, I feel that my relationship with my family in New Zealand, so my brother was based in New Zealand. Some of you may have heard, heard the international accent. Um, I am originally from New Zealand. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a challenge for me right now is how much do I give of myself? Because I've created a life here in Australia, in Sydney. And whilst it was always an, an important part of my life, New Zealand, it was a small part. So I'm actually, you know, I'm challenged with, understanding um yeah how much i i let almost my brother come into my life now because he's almost playing a bigger role dead than he was when he's alive and and so that is one of the things that i'm i'm challenged with and and if you listen to you know the grief chain you you would have heard me say something along these lines before so i think i'll i'll, I'll say like many that is a struggle for me i always try to give to myself first um, t- two other things is, so I'm a volunteer surf lifesaver at Bondi Surf Club. Shout out to shout out to any clubbies out there. I love the ocean. It's one of my happy places. It's where I go to um, relax. I, I love volunteering. It is a demand on time. Um, I've just committed slightly more time to it. And what I've found is that element of giving, because I I love it so much, it, it does, it does, it's it's a bit difficult from a time management point of view, but it, it's really adding value to my and making me happier um, as I struggle with some other other elements of giving. Um, the second point, of, so I guess what I'm saying there is, you know, you, you know, give to yourself first. Understand what it is that makes you happy and or who you want to hang around with, play with, whatever, and then see if you can give to them. And it may not be your family if you're dealing with the loss of a loved one. It may be something else, like for me, the surf club. The second thing I want to highlight um, is often we set the bar too high when it comes to this kind of stuff, I believe. So giving can be just being a good neighbour. Giving can be giving um, a little bit of time to uh, someone. It can be smiling uh, on the street. It can be 
uh, buying someone a coffee. It can be giving some money to someone, a homeless person, or it can be, you know, donating some of your time or your clothes to a local charity. So often, and this is jumping into kind of habits here, but as well in behavior change, uh, many of you would have heard of the book, speaking of habits, called Atomic Habits. The gentleman I mentioned at the start of this podcast is BJ Habits, the book he wrote, Tiny Habits. You get the idea. Atomic, tiny, I call them micro. Um, whether it's you giving a little bit more to overcome an obstacle or whether it's trying to create a new habit or replace a bad one, one of the tricks, if you like, is to start really small. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that uh, helps you and your listener a little bit and answers that, at least partially answers that that question and that observation. Yeah, it does. Thank you. And I think whether it's grief or we've lost a job or something's happened, a marriage is broken down, you know, it is hard to put yourself first when you're trying to support people around you. Um, and I think, you know, for me, it's been starting those those habits, um, small ones to try and look after myself first before then I can help others, which is that's always the saying, isn't it? Put your what is the oxygen mask on before you help anyone else? That's right. That's right. And start really small. Start really small. I wonder, Gareth, if we've got time to even launch into the habits or whether we need to have a secondary podcast focused on habits. What are your thoughts? Because it is a big uh, topic and um, we spent a lot of time unpacking just the first part of our conversation. Mm. Look, I'm happy to unpack loss and suffering a little bit more and perhaps kind of I'm not sure whether I've done justice to talking about techniques and perhaps tools that have worked for me so if you're happy for me to download a little bit on that and then on the next one we can actually jump into a four-step habit stacking tool that um, will will actually provide your listeners with a um, a relatively easy way to start to embed healthy new habits. So I'm happy to do that if you think that's a good idea. Yeah, I think that would be great if we could just unpack this part of our conversation a bit more and then have a, a follow-up session. That would be fantastic. Okay. Do you want me to just download a little bit more then? Yes, on, on please. I'd, I'd love you too. It's been just so great chatting to you and just having the opportunity to talk to someone else that's in a, a similar situation um, around how we just manage when we're faced with uh, these types of events. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you again for the opportunity. So I just want to call out that word similar situation because you're right to say that. Um, what I've learned is that, and, you know, my my relationship with suicide started when I was 21 uh, when I lost one of my best friends to suicide who my brother also knew well, a family friend. And whilst at a high level, you can say, you know, that type of loss, and it's, it doesn't have to be suicide, it could be divorce or being made redundant, whatever it is, there are similarities there. But, you know, with the work I've done on myself, my own mental health, um, and learning the how habits can help us change um, and the importance of focusing on ourselves first, I felt that with my brother, um, when he was alive, that I understood his journey reasonably well. And in hindsight, I didn't. So whilst I know this isn't what you're saying, but I, I, I feel that it's just so complex and so hard and, and we belittle is not the right word, but I'm very conscious that my experience of grief, your experience of grief and loss, there are similarities there. There are tools that we can use to help us overcome and or manage our loss better. Um, but wow, everyone is just so different, right? It's so different. Um, but I can perhaps tell a story that if, if any of you are, because because my journey has been an internal journey as well, and I, I feel that, you know, the gift, one of the gifts that I haven't talked about my brother uh, has helped me with is to unpack my own uh, issues, my own uh, anxieties and, and, and that voice in my head myself so I can become a better human being, which I believe I have. And he's helped me do that as I was trying to help him, um, you know, arguably unsuccessfully because of him suiciding. Um, but, and since uh, we lost him in August, you know, that that gift that I've talked about, part of it is he's, 
he's I, I guess it, he's, his loss has reinforced for me the importance of of some of the stuff we've talked about about focusing on the present, about loving kindness, um, and also I've recognised that and with help from others that loss is everywhere, right? As as we've talked about, it's not just you know these big ticket items for lack of a better word. You know we. We we lose our youth. We we as we get old, we lose some of our flexibility. Our, our, there's a whole lot of stuff we're losing constantly. So um, loss is everywhere, and so it's our our ability and our relationship, I guess, with it. And I, I go back to those. So perhaps I'll pause and then I'll just summarize what I've what I've babbled on about. Um, just in case there's something you want to add, and then I'll wrap it up by um, linking that kind of losses everywhere to some of the tools to help us cope with all elements of loss. But I'm going to pause now just in case you want to jump in. It was, sorry, it was interesting when you were saying that because um, during COVID, we all lost a lot. And um, for me, I think one of the biggest losses was my sister moving. She'll hate me saying this. Oh, she probably won't listen. That's okay. Um, my sister moving to Byron Bay because uh, I lost seeing her every day and my nephews every day. Um, and so for me, that was a big grief before my mum got sick. Um, but then at the same time, it was losing my freedom and transitioning into a parent. So, I mean, there's lots of, as you said, there are lots of different things that we're losing and gaining uh, through these types of experiences. 100%. 100%. And it's interesting you talk about COVID because um, my, my, so my kids are a little bit older than your child. <laughs> but I, I had the pleasure of homeschooling during the first and second lockdown, along with my wife here in Sydney. And you know, going back to looking after yourself first, what I realised under under quite intense moments of stress, because whilst I'm a coach and trainer, I'm definitely not a primary school teacher. Um, I, I, at times, I needed to just I needed to get in nature. So that's something that up until then, a lot of the people that I, um, you know, talk with and, and learn from and some of my mentors talked about the power of getting out in nature. And whilst as a surfer and someone who's connected to the ocean, you know, I was doing that, but that was more kind of intuitively. I found during COVID homeschooling, my stress levels would be so high. Sometimes I just need to step back, go outside when I could, sit under a tree Um for sometimes just for 10 minutes, and that would be enough. So, yeah, I feel that, that was interesting you mentioned COVID because that was that was actually that that moment of stress and that that obstacle, if you like. Um, again, I, not on purpose, but I, I kind of turn it into an opportunity because if I hadn't had to deal with homeschooling and my stress levels skyrocketed so much during that period, I wouldn't have realised the power of being out in nature and that even 10 minutes sitting under a tree um, could kind of rejuvenate me and get me a bit more on an even keel and, and remove myself from that reaction phase <laughs> back into that. I can now respond a bit more calmly. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, we could have a whole a whole episode on COVID and I didn't even homeschool, but just living with, within, living with your partner 24-7. Um, I mean, there's all different things. But the point about going outside into nature, I think, is a is a good point around when we're feeling stressed, just even trying to have that 10 seconds of breathing or just trying to bring you back into that present moment um, to help reduce your stress levels can be really important. And um, getting outside is one really good strategy. 100%, 100%. Would you like me just to, I'll try to do it quickly, just download a few of those kind of tools, techniques or concepts around um, stress, I guess stress management for lack of a better word. That would be great, and then if we can, um, then we can do the next one on the habits, and I think that will all flow really well. Okay, amazing, amazing. So I think I kind of, again, I want to qualify. Everyone's different. Um, what works for me won't necessarily work for you or your listeners, but there are some kind of commonalities, almost some universal truths here. I believe in life, and and one of them is our view of time. So. Um, often some people will view, help let their past define them. I know I did, you know, I'm a drinker, okay? Or, you know, I'm 
we, we identify with moments or activities or elements of our past. And sometimes those are negative. If they are negative, you really need to, I shouldn't say you really need to, I don't really like the word should, but let me rephrase that. One of your opportunities is to try and reframe that past event and or ask yourself, how is this helping me today? My narrative, my um, stress around that or be that, that person who I used to be, recognizing that every seven years, every single cell in your body has changed. So you truly are a different person and can be a different person tomorrow than you are today. So that's the past. The present was around just trying not to compare ourselves to others. I'll talk a bit more in the next time around core values and comparing the right things. Um, we all do it. Just, just again, try to understand what's really important to you. And you'll probably uncover that it's it's probably not the house you live in, the car you drive, the holidays you can afford. Um, so, and often those are the things I know, putting my hand up, I compare myself to others um, about, and I should, well, I, I try not to, let's just say the future, as we know, the future and past outside our circle of control, even our circle of influence. And we'll talk about this next time, but really what we do is we reverse engineer that. There are actions and activities habits you can do today that will affect your future but what we want to try not to do is stress about that future event that is is completely outside our control what is in our control are those small actions we can take in the present um i talked about setting the bar too high i'm a big believer having lost certainly the last two people close to me that i've lost to suicide i believe they set the bar too high i believe they compared themselves not that I was in their heads, but I knew them both well, that they were measuring their, in parentheses, success on the wrong things and setting the bar too high. And that comes with creating new habits. That comes with, I think, most things in life, in my opinion. Um, turning obstacles into opportunities, we probably unpacked that enough. We talked about circles of control. One thing I touched on is, and again, we'll talk about this a bit next time, creating either verbal or visual cues to help you um, either adjust uh, what you're thinking at that point in time and or take a small action, uh, I feel work really well. So I mentioned like my home office, there's half a dozen or eight post-it notes. Um, most of them are affirmations or mantras. And when I'm speaking with those big, tough, Kiwi blokes that I sometimes do and I start talking about affirmations and mantras and I can see them looking at me. I mentioned Richie McCaw, the ex-All Black captain who who used both. So if they're good enough for him, they're good enough for us. Um, and I'll probably, I'll, I guess I'll finish on that note at the risk of um, going for too long. And, and that's a really good point at the end, I think. And this is a generalisation, but uh, generally men, men I I know anyway, um, the type of language doesn't resonate well with them and mm. it can come across uh, as a bit fluffy or don't be ridiculous. And I think being able to um, align that type of messaging with uh, male role models is really positive in um, supporting the change in language and the way they see and hear things. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. I put my optimistic hat on and, um, you know, as a parent of a 12-year-old boy and having been exposed to his schooling as well as my daughter's school. And the good news is, at least in my experience, many of the schools today are, are already doing that reframing. And if I compare it to uh, when I went to school, uh, yeah, I feel that we're definitely heading in the right direction there, which is nice. Yeah, it is because, I mean, the statistics show us that you know, men are at higher risk of mental health and well-being challenges. And then if you overlay that with complexities of dyslexia and neurodiversity, then you know you're you're adding and adding to a big pile of ongoing difficulties. So I think if we're able to um, support men in talking more about their difficulties and what they're facing and reframing using, more positive language. Um, we have happier, healthier men and happier, healthier families and communities and the flow on effect is enormous. So I really appreciate uh, you coming on the show, Gareth, and for talking about such a sensitive topic. Um, 
for you and for some of our listeners that will be hearing this story as well today. And I'm really excited that we're able to continue the conversation talking about habits and ways that we can support ourselves and then in turn support those that we love. So thank you so much. Uh, Yeah, thank you, Shad. Thanks for your listeners too. Really appreciate the opportunity. You can find out more about Gareth and the work he's done, including the habit stacking at rethinkdyslexia.com.au. And again, if anything we discussed today may have been triggering for you, then your mental health really does matter and it's important that you prioritise it above all else. So seek some help through Lifeline at 13 1114 or Beyond Blue Counselling on 13 Beyond Blue also have an online counselling service that you can access through beyondblue.com.au. Thank you for listening. And bye for now. If you haven't done so already, make sure you sign up to our mailing list so you can keep up to date with everything we are doing at Rethink Dyslexia. So head to rethinkdyslexia.com.au. And don't forget, if there's anything you heard today that was distressing, you can contact Lifeline on 13 11 14 or Beyond Blue on 1300 22 46 36. Thanks for listening and bye for now.